Amen. Um, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath once again, everyone. Happy All right. I pray. Praise God. That's nice. I like that. Um, I pray that everyone has been following for the past few weeks some of these things in which we've been going over. If, um, and I pray that in our studies we, we are seeing the importance of the things in which we're looking at and that the Lord is opening up. We have to believe that the Lord is opening these things up as we teach that we're at the fifth day of the fourth month. And at this point, this is where Christ himself is really trying to take possession of the people that claim to be following him. It's, it's, this, it's at this point in the church's experience where Christ is trying to make himself general of our life. You know, he's trying to make himself the commander of all that we do and, and the one that tells us where to go and what to teach, when to teach, how to teach, and who to teach to. And um, because the Bible says while we, were, when, um, while we were children, we spake as children and so forth, but when we became a man, what do we do? We put away childish things. And, and you no longer speak as a child. You no longer act. You no longer go where you desire to go. But now you're about your father's business, and you go where the father wants you to go. You go where Christ wants you to go. But if we don't recognize how Christ moves and where he goes, then we, we will be afraid to go with him, and we will end up running from his presence. And this is what is going to happen to many people. Because they don't know how Christ works, therefore they won't know how to work with him when he works in a manner in which they've never seen him work before. And Swinon went over the garment, and the garment is not one thing, it's many things. It's, it's, it's the righteousness of Christ, it's the character of Christ, it's the spirit of God, it's the oil, it's obedience, it's holiness. It's, it, God just sums it up in one thing, garment. Yeah. He just says garment. He, we just need to have all these things and we need to check our garments. We need to check that we have the spirit of prophecy right, the oil right, the fruits right, the righteousness right, the obedience right. This is what it means to investigate ourselves, examine ourselves, and to see whether we be in the faith whether we be in the faith of Jesus Christ. And not too many people understand these things, and, and the Lord knows that, but the Lord wants us to understand this one thing. I've heard this excuse. For some, it's an excuse. For some, it's, 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 it's self-affliction. They're wounding themselves um, in light of saying this, what I'm about to say. And I know I've done it before. Um, and one of those things, like, I don't understand. I don't understand what the minister's saying. And none of it is making any sense to me. It is too much. I, 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 do I have to really know all of that? And, 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 and all these things. One, Satan is putting those thoughts into your mind. That's one. And two, it's your own evil heart that's putting those thoughts into your mind. That's two, because Christ always encourages. He never discourages. He always encourages learning of the Father. He says, learn of me. Learn of the Father and the Son. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He says, learn of me. He says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is what? Easy, and my burden to study is light. I'm not asking you to study something hard. It's very easy what I'm asking you. Satan's way is hard because you have to keep lying in order to keep that way going. But my way is truth, and it stays truth in the past, stays truth today, and it will stay truth tomorrow. But his way changes throughout time in order to contend with my self-same truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're going over, the, 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 this contention between truth and error. And I just want to read this quote to give us encouragement to stop beating ourselves up and stop allowing Satan to beat us up and take up our Bible and study it. That's, 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 Christ says it's easy. His yoke is easy. And I really do believe that. And I pray towards it. I say, Lord, it's easy. I can understand this. And I see the Lord answers prayers when I don't understand something. If I need to know it at that time, he'll explain it to me. Or maybe I'll, I'll need to know it two years from now, two months from now. But it doesn't matter. If I need to know it, the Bible says our Heavenly Father is more willing to give the Spirit to them that ask. So I have to believe that. That he will give it to me when I ask. And when I have need for it, when the time comes for my need, he will supply my need for that time. Mm -hmm. So this quote says, we're not going to read the whole thing. The first one, it says, do not, you can read the whole thing on your, time, on your own time. It said, do not confer with flesh and blood. Do not say, there are some things I do not understand. Of course, they, of course they are. Your mind is clouded, but take one step that you do see, then you can see, then you can see another. Yeah. So simple. So everything that we teach, if you just see one thing, just walk in that. I, I don't, I've always understood that. I don't expect to understand everything that's said because our minds are clouded. But whatever the Lord shines into our heart, that's what you take because that's what the Lord wanted you to receive. Yeah, and build upon that which he, he, he shown, and you will get more light because that's what's necessary for you at that time. 
And we have to believe that the minister who comes up and ministers to us is ministering to, to us our needs. That's what he's here to do. That's why he's called a minister. He ministers the church's needs because angels minister to our needs. And, but if the minister is unfaithful, the Lord will also let you know. If the minister is not being truthful, you will know. And if the minister is being truthful, you will also know. So we've been going over this for the past few weeks, the, the, the great controversy. And I pray those who have been following that um, by the grace of God will go through these series. Because I do understand this one thing. We all need to understand this one, that God always works through men. He always have men in a crisis. And we're about to go, America, America is about to be plunged in a crisis such as, such as never been. From, from since we reached 89, America's just been having crisis like it's never had before. They've never did something. They never did what they did in 96 before. They never seen something like 9-11 before. They never seen something like 2008 before. They never seen something like 2014 before. They never seen something like 2016 before. They never seen something like COVID before. And they never about to see something that they're about to see what's about to happen before. Is everyone following? Everything that's happened since 89, this America and the world has never seen before. This is the first time. This is the first time we had a president that's not a part of the family of the presidential, whatever they want to call it. This is the first time that we see laws being confused about a man and a woman. This has never been, this, this would have never been thought of by Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Theodore Roosevelt. They would have never had that problem. If, if something like that come up, they thrown it into the fire. That is, it would have been that easy for them because they had a Protestant mindset. They had a mindset that, that honored the Bible, at least to some degree. But once we reach 89, it's like Protestants forgot that they're Christians, and they forgot that there is a difference between right and wrong, male and female. There is a difference. There's a clear distinction, but somehow America has gotten confused, and now we're seeing things and activities like we've never seen. You know why? Because we're at the end of the world. This spirit you can only see when you reach the end of a nation. That's what Jesus says. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be where? In the end. If Jesus declares the end from the beginning, then what you see now is declaring that this is America's end. You only see this lifestyle when you reach the end, not the beginning. It's always in the end that you see this lifestyle. This is one of the greatest signs that America is done. It's America is on its way out the way we see it now. It's on its way out. But why? Why is this? Because of the great controversy. So we read this quote last week. Um, she says, um, just go down with me to the bowl. This is in the last week's presentation. It says, she's talking about we should trace the rise of the great controversy and of the work of redemption. He should, he should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the, through the records of history and prophecy. To, to the great consummation. What's the great consummation? Michael standing up. That's the great, that's the end. It, it, that's the world is done. Once Michael stands up, it's done. This is, we should trace all the way down to Michael standing up because the, the, the course of this life, it's over. This life of being able to choose between right and wrong, it's done. Every choice has been made in every generation. That's the consummation, it's done. Everyone's made their choice between these two great principles. The spirit of truth, this is what Swinton was going on, and the spirit of error. Everyone has made their choice as to which spirit they're going to allow to control their lives. It's finished. We've reached the consummation, and now the real battle between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error can take place. It couldn't take place while men had to make their decision. But once everyone's made their great decision, made that decision, now we're going to have the real great controversy between Christ and Satan. Now Christ can really fight, and now Satan can really, and it's all, whole, no, everything goes at this point. Everything goes. Whatever Satan want to bring, he can bring it, because Christ is going to bring all the angels with him. He's going to bring everything with him, too. Mm -hmm. Amen? So if he's going to bring everything, if Christ is allowed to bring everything, he's going to allow Satan to bring everything. And we have to be ready for, for this huge conflict. So she says, going on, she said, um, he should, uh, lost a part. Yeah, just that part, loud and clear, please. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience. How in the act of the life, of life, he himself reveals one or the other of the two antagonistic motives, and how, he, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. That's us right now. Mm -hmm. 
We're literally deciding on which side of the controversy we'll be found. And what is the controversy? John tells us John is going to add to the controversy. He says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. This is what Swinton was going over. He, does, he that is of God obeys. Mm -hmm. And here's what, Paul, here's what John says. He that is not of God heareth not us. He that is not of God doesn't obey. Yeah, so they, they don't have the spirit. And here's how you know. We hereby know. Hereby what? Know no, we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. The spirit of truth always leads to obedience. Amen. And the spirit of error always leads to disobedience. This is the great controversy. Obedience versus disobedience. Truth versus error. Right versus wrong. Holiness versus unholiness. Just versus unjust. Righteousness versus unrighteousness. And he that is unjust, let him stay in that controversy still. And he that is righteous, let him stay in that controversy still. And now we can fight. I got all my angels with me. Satan got all his people with him. So now let's go to war. Let's now go to war. Let's bring this great controversy between God and Satan to a close because I have my people and Satan has all his people. And now we can see God reveal himself like the world has never seen him reveal himself before. Can, are we prepared to stand in that presence of revelation when Christ reveals himself in all his fullness and Satan reveals himself in all his fullness? Are we prepared for that? Are we really prepared for that? If we don't have on the garment, we will know who's prepared because Christ says the shame of your nakedness, the part in your life where you're disobedient is going to be made known. The area where you're naked, Christ is going to make sure you reveal it. He's designing a test right now, wherever I'm disobedient, wherever any one of us is disobedient, attest it because Satan knows where you're disobedient. He's the one leading you to do the very thing you're doing right now. So, so he's designing a test specifically for you so that you would give up your garment and come on his side forever. And Christ is also designing a test to reveal his people so that they can give up this world and come on his side forever. It's, it's just everyone is coming to the test. And we're all coming to this test whether we want to or not. But Christ has given us advanced knowledge and advanced warning so that we can properly prepare for this test. And be re it's, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Amen? And we just want to be ready. Isaiah says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no what? Knowledge. So why do we go into captivity? Lack of knowledge. All right. So, so Adam and Eve, I wish we could go over this. Adam and Eve brought the whole human family into captivity. Right there. A knowledge was taken from them. They lost, they lost something. Something was lost. And Christ had to be the one to find it for us. And for 6,000 years, Christ has been finding it. It takes that long to restore what they lost. It takes that long. So the greatest knowledge that they lost, Christ has been building and building and building and building and building. And the, the end of the world gets to receive that which was taken from man. We get, what was taken from them? Eternal life. They were, they were privileged to have eternal life. But it was taken from them. So Christ won it back for them. But how do you get eternal life? Jesus says that they might what? No, it's a knowledge. It's a knowledge. So to get eternal life, we need a knowledge of God. But what was the two things we need a knowledge of? What did Satan say? Thou shalt not what? He promised eternal life in disobedience. Christ promises it in obedience. So we need a knowledge about life, death, obedience, disobedience. We need to know the right obedience, wrong disobedience, and we need to have a knowledge of death. But to have a knowledge of death is very fearful. It's a very fearful knowledge to have. Because you're going to have to see that you shall surely what? die. Well, how is God going to show people that they shall surely die? He's going to create an environment that everything around you scream in death. It's called the Sunday law. Is everyone following? The Sunday law is where we're going to greatly learn about the wages of sin, that it's really death. We're going to see people die in the most strangest of ways that, that we've never seen before. They're going to suffer the consequences of the curse of death. Only those who have on the garment will be shielded from that curse of death. Is everyone following? All right. But at the same time, he also says, you shall be as God. So Adam and Eve lost the knowledge of what makes one God. So what are they going to need a knowledge of? And where do we find that? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? There's our knowledge of God right there. Is everyone following? This is what the great controversy is over. These two things right there, death 
and the resurrection. Man and God, life and death. This is the great controversy. That's it, life. Who has the power to promise and give life? And who's the lie and the deceiver saying he can give you life when he really can't because he himself don't have it? He, the, the curse of Cain is also upon Satan. He's waiting for his execution. This is what he's waiting on. And while he's awaiting execution, he's trying to bring as many people as he can with him to be executed with him. And Christ is trying to save us from that terrible judgment that's resting upon Satan and his angels. This is what he's trying to save us from. So let's go down to this next one. Um, Egypt, captivity knowledge. So Israel, they went into captivity in Egypt because they lost the knowledge. Let's just read the quote. Go down with me to the bowl. They're in Egypt. This is the great controversy. We're just tracing it throughout history, how Satan warred against the knowledge of God. And it says, and being surrounded with idolatry, many of them had lost the knowledge of the true God and had, and had forgotten his law. And they united with the Egyptians in their worship, their worship of the sun, moon and stars. Also, also of the beasts and, and images, the, the work of man's hands. Everything around, everything around the children of Israel was calculated to, to, to make them what? Forget what? All right, before I go there, I'm going to say this. I want to go to this part. It says, they worship the sun, moon, and stars and beasts. What did God give Adam and Eve when they fell? In order to bring them back to a knowledge of himself. The, the nature. This is what we've been going over. He gave them nature. Adam and Eve was given an understanding in nature. They lost that. Once they sinned, they lost their ability to see God in nature. So Jesus had to restore that again. He came and he gave them the gospel. Jesus put the gospel in the language of nature. And in order for man to understand it, he gave them his spirit. He gave them a garment. And by wearing this garment, it shows their connection to heaven. And it shows the angels who the one that they're to come and minister to. It's the garment you have on that gives the angels the right to come and minister to you. Is everyone following? Yeah. So they were being ministered to. They were being taught nature. But over time, after a long interval, nature, which should have served to lead the minds of people to God, ended up served to serve to lead the mind to worship nature. And they were, this is the system Satan set up to war against God's idea of how to bring people back to him. It was through nature. So the Lord had to change. But I just wanted to catch this ball. Notice what she says. Everything around them was calculated to make them forget God. Has Satan changed? Has he changed? No. So the banks that are around us is to make us for, to forget God. Mm -hmm. The nail salons is to make us to forget God. The bowling alleys is to make us to forget God. Oh, Walmart everywhere yeah. is to make us forget God. Lord. Publix everywhere is to make us to forget God. Target everywhere is to make us to forget God. Payless is to make us to forget God. The shopping stores is to make us to forget God. The amusement parks is to make us to forget God. Billboards is to make us to forget God. Uber is to make us to forget God. The computers is to make us to forget God. Is everyone following? She said everything around them was calculated to make them to forget God. Everything. God gave man knowledge and they used that knowledge to make people forget God no matter what they made. Cars is to make people forget God. Planes is to make people forget God. Huh? It's not about them being bad things. They're, all, they're designed to make you forget God. What you do with those it's things true, is up to you. No, Amen? This is, this, this is, is everyone following? Amen. So when we leave this house, just remember, everything around you is calculated to make you forget. So why does God want his people in the country? Because everything around them is to make them remember. Amen. The sun, moon, stars, trees are still appointed by God to make us remember. Go ahead, Sweeney. Go ahead. Now you will see why destruction must come. Amen. It has to come. Because the Lord has to remove everything. That's that making people forget. Make forget what did he do to Egypt? It's remember Amen. The day. Amen. When those things are gone, you have no choice but to think. Amen. This tablet is designed to make me forget God. It is. But, Sineron, we can make right use of it. We can make right use of these things. We don't. That's why the Sabbath says, remember God, even whatever circumstance you're in. Remember God. Look at the tablet and, and ask God to teach you something about him. What can this teach me about you? Yes. Keep your mind stayed up on him wherever you walk. The billboards, it doesn't matter. Whatever, if the billboards say, 
curse God and die? Lord, what can that teach me about you? They say curse God and die. Yeah. What can that teach me about you? So that I don't think about cursing you and dying. Is everyone following? If we understood how Satan works, we'll be careful about what we do. Everything around us, whether it be good or bad, is calculated to make us forget God. It doesn't matter. But it what? If our minds are stayed up on him. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. When Daniel went into Babylon, everything around Daniel was calculated to make him forget God. But what did Daniel do? He purposed in his heart that he will not allow the things around him to make him forget God. And, and the first thing that Satan started with was what? Food. So how many restaurants do we see around us? How many do we think that's an accident? All these fast food restaurants, vegan fast food restaurants, they're all calculated to make us, I, the Lord said spend some time here because just so that we can see the dangers that we're literally, we're living in Egypt all over again. And like Swindon said, this is one of the signs that God is going to bring judgments. He has to, because all these things, man has come to worship them instead of worshiping him. To worship means to serve. Man is giving more service to the things that's leading them to forget God and giving themselves to God himself. Jesus says, worship God and him only shalt thou what? Serve. Worship means to serve. Whatever you give the most service to, that's what you worship. See, some of us think that we just fall. No. Wherever you spend your most time and what you spend, that, that's what you're serving. That's what you're worshiping. If you spend a lot of time on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the movie theaters, the nail salon, Walmart, Target, that's what you serve. That's what you serve. That's where most of your time is. It's there. And the Lord says, Hump, repent and turn from that. And if you don't want to do it, I'm going to destroy those things. Either way, I'm going to destroy them anyway. Because they're only leading you to forget. And one of the greatest elements that leads people to forget God, money. Money. Because money, the love of money is the what? The root of all forgetfulness of God. That's what that's telling you. Money leads many. When Satan says, you shall be as God, what was he sending her desire on? Money. The things of this world. That's what he, that's what he put in E's heart, the love of money. From that point on, humanity took on the desire for that which, they, which makes them powerful. Amen. 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 Well, how blind did Adam and Eve become? It was already theirs. Yeah. It was already theirs. So you know what the Lord showed? The only way Satan can lead people astray is by holding out something and make them think it's worth desiring. So then he leads them to disobedience. Some, and you already have these things. Jesus says, all power is given to me. It's mine's, but maybe it's not right for you to have it at that time. So I had to spend a little time there. I just want us to see everything around us. When we leave this door, is specifically calculated to lead us to forget God. Whether it be good or evil, it's specifically calculated by Walmart is exactly where it is on purpose. Target is where it's exactly where it is on purpose. The nail salon, that's exactly where he wanted it. Is everyone following? Nothing is accidentally put anywhere. Nothing. If we believe in God and we believe in and we believe there's a devil, everything is where God wants it to be, and everything is where Satan wants it to be, wherever the Lord allows him to have it. And it's specifically calculated. That, how do I know that? Because Satan knows there's lots in every Sodom. So he specifically set things up to deceive that lot. And he knows there's Abrahams in the country. So he set things up to draw Abraham back into Egypt. Did Abraham go back into Egypt? Yeah, and he fell. He fell for his trap. The Lord allowed it to happen to test Abraham. Is everyone following? Everything around us is calculated to make us to forget God. But the Bible says, whose minds have stayed upon him? Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Amen. We can have peace even though we're in the midst of everything that's leading us to forget God. We can still have peace if our minds is stayed up on the living God. Go ahead. Um, another thing that could be added to that is Titus chapter 1, verse 15. It says, unto the pure all things are pure.
pure. Hi, that's nice. But Amen. unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Save Amen. Their mind and their conscience is defiled. That's, that's really nice. That means whatever your eyes look upon, you can see purity. Amen. You can see purity if you have the mind of Christ. Amen. You, and because you see that, you know how to, you now know by the grace of God how to take that and lead the unbelieving mind to purity. So now you can live in Egypt and not be of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And you're waiting for God to deliver you from out of that crooked and perverse society of, of unbelievers. Amen. You're just waiting. The Lord's going to take us out because he sees we long to come out. And so he will give us the desire, desires of, us, of our hearts. But there's something we have to understand, but that's not our focus. We'll just go on to this next one. So from, um, from Eden to Mount Sinai, nature was their educator. Satan warred against, against this education method. Go down to this next one. Can somebody read that loud and clear? Just, the, just yeah, the bowl. I guess it's a lot of bowls. But read that loud and clear, please. He did not even then trust his precepts to the memory of a people who were prone to forget his requirements, but wrote them upon tables of stone. He would remove from Israel all possibility of mingling heathen traditions with his holy precepts, or of confounding his requirements with human ordinances or customs. But he did not stop with giving them the precepts of the Decalogue. The people had shown themselves so easily led astray that he would leave no door of temptation unguarded. Moses was commanded to write. What was Moses? Commanded. So there was no commandment to write before that. So writing now became God's new weapon of warfare to fight against Satan and use a nature to that's make men forget. What's nice about this is the quote where she says, they saw the commandment. She says, when we saw it, we knew that we were keeping a law given by the heathen. Amen. The pages. Because it says, it says in this quote plainly that God wrote it himself. Praise so God. That there were no hidden, uh, heathen trend traditions added Amen. to it. Amen. So when they saw it, they knew God wrote it. Amen. And there was no, no And Sunday was a heathen tradition. That's nice. It was that's a heathen true. tradition that's added to what God what wrote. So by what Swinton just said, what kind of a punishment is waiting for the Catholic Church? Mercy. A terrible one. It really reached onto heaven. It really touched what God wrote and told men that he changed it. Man, the punishment that's coming to the papacy. It didn't war against man only. It lifted itself up against God himself. So God's going to answer him himself. And anyone who joins the papacy in that, God have mercy upon such a soul. And this is why we need the garment of Christ so that we don't end up on that side. Because whether you, she said, we're all deciding on which side we're going to play. We're all making that decision right now. We're all making it. We're either interested in what's being presented and we're disinterested. And Satan is going to breathe on you and have you join his rebellion. Interest is what determines who breathes on you. Interest. That's what the, the quote Swin and Red taught us. All who was interested got the breath of God. All who was not interested in careless got the breath of Satan. And they united with him in his rebellion and warfare against the method God has chosen to, to fight this great controversy. So how are we? Are we interested in what's presented? Our attitudes will determine that based upon how we leave when we leave here. Go ahead, Sister Emily. Just finish off that portion, please. As God should bid him judgments and laws, giving minute instruction as to what was required. Amen. Can I have a reader for the next one? Loud and clear. The bowl. Just the bowl. The sacrificial, the sa the sacrificial system committed to Adam was also perverted by his descendants. Okay, hold on. I just want us to see. God gave Adam and Eve nature, but he also added a sacrificial system. Amen. The sanctuary work was always connected to whatever weapon God gave. Amen. This is one of the signs that you're God's people. Amen. Whenever he connects the sanctuary to the method he's given you, you're his denominated person. That and that's how I know God is leading us. I'm not worried about what anyone says against this message Amen. at all. Because the, what, the, what the Lord is teaching us in regards to the sanctuary, that's the greatest evidence, the light on the sanctuary, that, man, his presence is amongst you. Amen. Because others have nature, others have the Bible, others have the spirit of prophecy, but he only gives the sanctuary to those who have on the garment. Amen. Isn't that what October 22nd taught us? Amen. Only those who have this on gets that. What does that mean? Only those who obey what nature taught them, what the Bible taught them, what the spirit of prophecy taught them, will receive the light of the change in the most holy place. Amen. Is everyone following? Amen. That's how I know God is behind what we're teaching. It doesn't matter what anyone wants to say. I know he's behind this. 
because he's explaining these things to us, and this is beyond human. This is, I hope that we're seeing that what we're teaching and learning is beyond human. It's beyond my capability to put stuff like this together. It's impossible for a human mind to do this. I hope we can really see this. Because if we can't see this, we're preparing ourselves to reject the light of Revelation 18. We're going to ascribe it to men. What Jeff did wasn't human. It was beyond human. Human couldn't do what Jeff did. And I acknowledge that I know my, our living God worked through Jeff Piffinger. And he worked through Jeff, Dario and Jamal up to a point. He worked through Mark. I know he did. I'm not afraid of confessing that he did. Amen. Just like I'm not afraid of confessing that he's working amongst us. I'm not afraid of that. Men may fight. They're supposed to fight. That's what, that's what Satan inspires them to do. To fight the people that God is using to recognize what he's doing. That they're doing their part. I got to do my part and lift up the banner high and say, get on board before you get rolled over. Amen? Amen. I have to do my part. God is going to roll some people over. He's going to. Because they're causing his people to forget the way. So he's going to have to roll them over by destroying their institutions. That's what he's going to start with first. Is everyone following? Because that's what he did in Egypt. Everything that was calculated to make them forget, God touched it. So One World Trade Center, what is the Lord going to do? Touch it. Because it's making people what? Forget. It's called a One World Trade Center. So this One World Trade in place is leading people to forget God. They didn't learn the first time, so maybe they'll learn the second time. Amen? Amen? All right, so next one, please. Um, continue, I should say. Superstition, idolatry, cruelty, and licentiousness corrupted the simple and significant service that God had appointed. Through long intercourse the idolater, with idolaters, the people of Israel have mingled many heathen customs. All right, you can stop there. So long intercourse. So from Adam to Mount Sinai, that was the long intercourse. So now we're going to go from Mount Sinai to Christ. That's another long intercourse. So whatever God gives to guide men until the next change it's to guide them for a long time till the next change. So Satan wars against it for a period of time, and God allows it until he comes to deliver his people from the captivity that they found themselves in for forgetting the method that God gave them to keep them out of the captivity. Mm -hmm. so, so God is coming to deliver us by, in fact, he came already since 89. It's called an increase of knowledge, an increase of coming out of captivity. By a loss of knowledge, captivity. So if knowledge is increasing, the Lord is slowly, steadily bringing us out of that captivity. Yeah. So that means the Adventist church, when Ellen White died, they immediately went into captivity. Yeah. Immediately. They, lost all yeah. they, they what? They all right. So keep that in mind. This is how Satan wars. If we can trace this, if we can trace his warfare, man, Satan is going to be angry with the people who can do this. Because they'll be able to detect his next move and his next move and his next move and his next move. And they're able to see their creator, Jesus Christ, uh, his move, his next move, his next move, and his next move. And they'll be able to, to make an intelligent decision on which side of the warfare they want to be on. Amen. Amen. That's what the Lord wants. So let's go down. From Mount Sinai to Christ, um, it, became, it, became the, the, it became the sanctuary services, the Old Testament, and, and nature. Um, another long interval, and jump down with me, um, Satan warred against that. So Satan had to set up a rival sanctuary system. God gave a sanctuary, so he set up a rival sanctuary. Let's read some of these things. Um, rival. Rival means one who is in pursuit of the same object. What's the object that Christ and Satan is in pursuit of? The hearts of men. That's what they're in pursuit of. They're in pursuits of the hearts of men. That they, Satan wants worship, God wants worship. God commands worship, Satan commands worship. God has a sanctuary, Satan has a sanctuary. God used nature, Satan used nature. God has a Bible, Satan has a Bible. God has a church, Satan has a church. God has a system, Satan has a system. God has schools, Satan has schools. God has a business, Satan has business. Is everyone following? Everything in this world is operating on that principle. Everything. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error is actively working right now. Everything around us is operating on these two principles. Either the spirit of truth is controlling Walmart or it isn't. Mm -hmm. Either the spirit of truth is controlling Publix or it isn't. Mm -hmm. Either the spirit of truth is controlling 
um, telco and T-Mobile and Apple and Verizon, or it isn't. Which spirit is controlling it? But praise God, God has agents in all of those things I just mentioned. Because he uses them from time to time to oppose the error, the, the methods they try to bring in. Amen. But the most strongest people God wants to use is his people that have an intelligent understanding of the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. They can intelligently warn people and tell men about these things. So jump down over rival and let's go down to the first um, rival. Um, so God in the wilderness gave them a sanctuary. So Satan immediately scrambled and started to teach pagans to build their temple. Immediately, he scrambled. Build a temple. And they did. And they literally did do one. And let's look at the first encounter of a pagan temple. Can I have a reader for the next one, loud and clear? The two powers. The two powers were for to tread down the host and sanctuary of paganism and the people. Tob was done it in the days of the judges by Nathaniel, saying to rival sanctuary. In the day of the who? Judges. Why not before the judges? This is, this is why not before the judges? Moses was alive, but why not before? God never had a temple. He couldn't war against what God didn't have. Is everyone following? He can't, he can't make a rival if the Lord didn't put something in place. So once Moses had the temple built, immediately Satan went off to go teach his pagan. He, how does he do it? He puts in there false teaching a desire to have a temple. That's how he communicates. Just like God communicates his will through doctrine, Satan communicates through wicked people through false teaching. God tells us what to do through the truth. Satan tells people what to do through lies. And what? Joshua. And yeah, Joshua amen. Killing them out. Amen. So they didn't have the time. But as soon as Joshua died, Joshua man, was, rival was, temples. Amen. Rival temples. Because now it's finished. Mm. Just keep in mind, this is how the papers he came up. The same way. The same way. Say, it's nothing new. It's the same thing. It's nothing new. The, the time we're living in, this is the last time this will happen. That's the difference. Amen. This is just the last time. Christ is bringing this rivalry to a close. And because Satan knows that he has but a short time before Christ brings it to a close, he's ramping up his rivalry. He's turning the fire up because this is his last time that he can do something like this. If possible, he would deceive who? But because of this is why the elect is not going to be deceived. Because they'll have an understanding of these two rivalries and know how to make the right decision. But because of persecution, it's not that people don't know the right decision. Because Satan turned up the fire of persecution, many are going to go on the wrong side because they're afraid of what? What are they afraid of? Yeah. Ah, so what do we need light on? Yeah. So that we're not afraid of it. Amen. So Christ has to make us see that fear of death before Satan brings the fear of death. Amen. Is everyone following? Amen. There's a message about death that's coming, and we better receive it. Because if we don't, no light, no life. You can't get life without dying. Amen. And what? And die. Christ is going to teach us a knowledge about death like we've never seen before. But it's built upon all the knowledge that he already gave. Because Satan has a weapon. He has a secret weapon with death that he's going to use. And he has a secret weapon with Sunday that he's going to use. And Christ is trying to prepare us. Because remember, he's rivaling. He's trying to steal man's life. He's trying to steal it. Darkness on Sunday, yeah, in proportion to the light. And Christ is trying to prepare so that we don't receive that, so that we don't drink that nastiness. All right, continue reading, please. Satan's rival sanctuary, the temple of Dagon, where the Philistines worship. Next one, please. Oh, sorry. You, you can stop there. Can you read the next quote? I just wanted us to see the rival temples. The next quote, please. Yes. When the temple at Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Ezra, the Samaritans who wished to join the Jews in its erection. This privilege was refused them, and a bitter animosity sprang up between the two people. Stop. Why was it refused? Ezra was an intelligent man of God. Ezra knew they were coming in to rival what he was doing. He knew that. Ezra, the Bible says Ezra set his heart to seek the will of the Lord and to what? And to do it. So by him doing that, he recognized the rival when he come. Ezra is you and I if we're faithful. We're going to recognize when men try to come in and help us build, get out. You're not coming to help build. You're coming to set up a rival right in the house of God. 
Because they were what? They were afraid of death. Right? Uh, amen. And then they were weeded amen. out. Amen. Amen. Ezra saw it, though. Mm -hmm. Ezra saw right through it. Ezra and Nehemiah, they saw right through that. Ezra and Nehemiah represents a people who are going to be building the temple of Christ, and they have the spirit of discernment to know who's coming in only to rival the work of their hands. And they're going to, no, we don't want your help. Keep your money. Keep your gold and your silver. Keep your fancy buildings and all the people with you. We don't want any of that. We're going to build a temple of the Lord without your help, and then their spirit's going to be revealed. This is what Swindon's about to read. Go ahead. Now. The Samaritans built a rival temple. What do they do? Mount Gerizim. So what was their spirit from the beginning? To rival. The Lord only revealed it by Ezra rebuking them. If they were honest, they would have received Ezra's rebuke. They would have received it. God only revealed their spirit that they were only really coming into rival, but they were going to do it from within instead of without. That, we have to have this kind of dessert. Ezra is you and I at the end of the world. If we're faithful, that's you and I. Okay. Thank you. Is that the end of it? Can I have a reader for the next quote, please? Not only did... And not only did Satan possess himself a rival to the sanctuary of Jehovah in the period of pagan worship, but throughout the Christian dispensation has that arch fiend possessed a rival temple of God. Can I go on? Yes, keep going. Thus much for the rival sanctuary of Satan. The sanctuary of God remains to be noticed at length. Connected with these two sanctuaries. Amen. Does everyone see why Daniel 8 question was now asked? How long? How long are you going to continue this rivalry to go on? And Christ says, on to 2,300 days, I'm going to bring this rivalry to its end. That's how we know we're at the end of the world. Christ is closing up this rivalry. How does he close it? He says, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is what Sunnah was going. Then every truth that these rivalry has introduced into society, I am going to cleanse this whole world of it before probation closes. I'm going to have a people that's going to raise up the foundation of the great controversy from heaven to earth all the way down to their time and set in before men in symbolic language and in plain language and in future language, cleansing the sanctuary. Here's the truth about Sunday. Here's the truth about the Sabbath. Here's the truth about death. Here's the truth about life. Here's the truth about jewelry. Here's the truth about women wearing pants and dress. Here's the truth about how to eat and meat and all of these things. Here's the truth about the day, um, the day and the hour. Here's the truth about whatever error has been introduced for over 6,000 years. Christ is literally going to sweep it all away before probation closes. Before it closes, he's going to do that. And if we're faithful, we get to be the instrument in his hand. Yeah, he's already doing these things. And we're, we get it by us seeing this. He's given us a taste of what we're about to see in the future. So what foolish person would align themselves with whatever error you're holding on to right now when you know that Christ is about to remove it? What foolish person would find themselves in a movie theater, an amusement park, when you know that Christ is about to destroy it? At any time, those things will be cut down. And if you're in there, you might just be the one that walk in there as a Christian and now it can come down. So that men may know not to transgress against God what you just did. He's going to use you as the example of, of, of what a Christian, a seventh-day Christian, shouldn't do. Is everyone following? That's how fearful it's getting for us now. That what we do, where we go, judgments is attached to it. Or life and blessings is attached to it. That's, this is the kind of level of warfare that we're now entering into as we continue. Can I have a read? Um, you don't have to read the next one. Um, I just want to put in there now. So God gave Moses writing. Moses was now commanded to write. So prior to that, there was no writing. And when you go read Patriarchs and Prophets, she says there was no books. There was no need for it. The guy that was alive at 100 years old that, that built the store, at 900 years old, he was still alive. So whatever you wanted to know, he was the book. He was the book that, that could help you build a store, a successful store in the time of Noah. But after the flood, because they so perverted it, the Lord still taught by nature. He taught Abraham the sun, moon, and stars. Look at the stars, so shall your seed be. Isn't that how he taught them? And then he had them dream, and then he walked through the furnace, and he learned the captivity. His children was going to, to captivity. That's what Abraham learned. Joseph and, and who? Joseph. Joseph. Amen. Joseph dreamed. But when they went into Egypt, they forgot how God works through these things. So the Lord had commanded Moses, write it out. I'm going to write, and you're going to write, and give them instruction. But here's what I love. 
Moses wrote how many books? Five, six. six. What are they? Why do you think Moses, God had Moses do that? Why do y'all think he had him do that? Huh? Think about Revelation 12, 17, what Swindon went over. To the law, the first five books, and to the testimony, the book of Job. Moses wrote according to the law, and the, test, the book of Job was Job's testimony. All Moses did was record for us Job's testimony. But the book of the law was what God told Moses. God told Moses that, but Job got the t Moses got the testimony from Job. Or, or, or he got Job's testimony, he wrote it. So every prophet that comes after that have to have that spirit. So the next writer, he has to, he, his book has to be connected to the law of Moses and the book of Job. And the next prophet that come, his book has to be connected to that prophet, which is connected to Job, which is connected to Moses. And the next prophet that come, he has to do the same thing, the same thing. And, and the next prophet that come, he has to do it. So every prophet's writing is connected to the first prophet's writing. Every one of them. Why is this important? So that we can recognize the true prophets when God raises them up. All of what they say is going to be connected to all of what the prophets said before, which go back to its source. The, the law and the testimony. Does anyone know what Job, one of Job's primary book is about? This is interesting. Does, uh, Michelle, you read Job's out. Sorry for calling you out, but I got to call you out. Job, what, what do you primarily see when you read Job's book? In, and, and Yes, it is a test of faith. Amen. Amen. Is it nature? Yes. And what's another one? There's one more that Job talks about a lot in his book. Suffering, Suffering and what? Death. Mm -hmm. Job has so much writing about death, you'll be amazed how much he talks about death and life. You'll be just look it up. I, I saw it. I'm like, man, I never seen that. Job wrote so much about death in his book. Why is that? Why do we think that is? Job is representing that. I'm like, that's why God's people at the end of the world is going to read the book of Job. Like Michelle just said, it's about the captivity. That's what Job is about. It's about being captive and how we escape the captive by, have, by not fearing death. What was Satan says? Touch what he has. Kill everything around him. Take all the institutions that feed him, that supplies him. Remove these institutions and watch Job curse you to your face. So the Lord said, okay, go remove Bank of America. Go remove Target. Go remove Walmart. And also, yeah, remove his children too. What did Job do? Okay, so what was Satan's next strategy? Touch his life. So what is the book of Job about? Life and death. From the very beginning, that's what we see. So everything in Job is teaching you about life and death, the death and the resurrection. That's what Job is about from beginning to end. So every prophet that come, that's what they're teaching. What's the law about? Life. Those who obey will have what? Life. That's what the, the law of Moses. So Life and death. Nice Amen. Thought. It just hit me as we were going through it. The antediluvians, they lived for 900 years. And if you wanted to know, you was just to go to the person. Amen. The Bible is written under the same principle. Praise God. Amen. If you want to know what, Mo if you want to know what Moses said, go to John. If you Amen. Go to the last writer, Amen. The last writer Amen. could go to Moses. Amen. You could go to Moses. And Amen. Moses, what, what, is what did you mean? It, the Lord Amen. just took it from no writing and he just... It's, it's the same principle. Same principle. Didn't change. Because yeah. nature is just in the Bible. Yeah. It's the same principle. You're still, the men that yeah. Amen. long ago is still here. Because what did Swinton just go over? God's method never changes. Never it never changes. But Satan, his, his stratagem, constantly changing. Now he's gonna constantly. Back, yeah. But he counters it. He tries to put up a counterfeit. So Moses wrote, Satan wrote also. It's the same thing. Same, same stuff. Same stuff. All the way down. Is everyone following? Put it back in a people. Who's going to now live forever. Amen. Yes. To know, All right. I wish we had time to go over what Swindon is going over. But one day, by the grace of God, we'll go into that. The, the controversy is over a life and death. That's really what it's over. Yeah. Who can take life and who can give life? Can can that, that's, life. that's what it's about. This is what it's really about. And this is why we have, But anyway, going on. So Satan warred against it by setting up rival temples. That's what he did. Moses wrote the first six books. The first five from, from um, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then he wrote the book of Job. And every writer that comes after that have to have that same spirit, because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost told Moses exactly what to write, 
And every prophet that came after had the same spirit, right? And the same thing Amen. based off Moses and the prophet. Back to Moses. Amen. Everything goes back. Moses laid the foundation for the Bible. That's what he did. Moses is the foundation of the word of God. And every prophet that came after that have to build upon that same foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's it. That's the foundation, the word of God. And God, so Moses was a man. He was a powerful God, powerful man chosen by God. Powerful man chosen by God to begin this work of the Bible. Now put that all together. John was a powerful man for the New Testament. Is everyone following? Because Satan warred against nature, sanctuary in the Old Testament, God now needs to change his method of warfare. So now he sends his son. Now, this one, ah, he can't mess with this one, not his son. Can't mess with this one. Now God is going to reveal what's written in the Old and just make it um, present truth. It's now, he's now going to fulfill what was recorded in nature and what was recorded in the Old Testament. Now he gave the New Testament as the weapon against Satan. But I want us to see something. I'm going to jump over this next one. Go down for time. So from, from the New Testament to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the 1260, the reason why I'm going there, to the 1260, it was the Old and the New Testament. This is what man had. But there was a problem. What was the problem? There was a problem. In all of this, it wasn't a problem, but it, 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 had the, it had the ability to create a problem because it was used wrong. They didn't have it in their language. It, they didn't have what? Didn't they didn't have it in their language. When it was nature, you needed an interpreter. Mm. When it was the Old Testament, what did you need? Mm. You needed a priest. Mm. When it went to the New Testament, what did you need? Mm. You needed apostles and prophets and teachers. Mm. You needed somebody to teach. It was shut up in Hebrew and Greek. It was shut up, and you need learned people to teach you the things. You know, I was trying to think about where Satan got that idea from. Because he tried to head it up by creating the papacy. Okay, that's where we're going. And I was trying to think about where Amen. he got that idea from Pentecost. Amen. He saw that they spoke different language. And he knew Amen. the commission was go ye into to all the world. In all nations. Amen. And he just went ahead. He Amen. Saw that the Bible was going to be translated. Amen. And he prepared for it. Yeah. So what do we see? So we see that because the New Testament is now here, so Satan set up the mystery of iniquity. That's what Sunni was going over. Yeah. The mystery of iniquity now began to work to, to come in and corrupt the translation of the New Testament. That, that's how he now warred. He warred now with the papacy. Paganism can't work. Why? Because Christ took all the teachings of nature and the Old Testament and the sanctuary and he put it into reality. He's the lamb. He's the bread. He's the tree. He's, he, he's this, the sanctuary on earth. is the sanctuary in heaven. The disciples, the 12 disciples, is, rep, was represented by the 12 tribes because the, the, the 12 disciples represent the 12 tribes of the whole world. The Jews are only representing the Christian church. Abraham was the father of the faithful because Christ is the father of the faithful. Adam was the son of God, so Christ is the son of God. Um, Moses was the one that delivered them from out of Egypt. Christ is the one that delivers us from out of sin, out of Egypt, out of captivity. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. So all of this was transferred over into the New Testament. So Satan, in order to rival that, he took all the teachings of paganism, and he, like so Swinon said, he just put it in Catholicism. So now he gave them Christian names. That's all he did. To continue with the warfare, he know he can't use pagan ideas anymore, so he just took the pagan ideas and made them Christian. So what does he carry with them? Still the wrong idea about death, and still the wrong idea about God. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. The wrong idea about death and the wrong idea about God. And what did the papacy magnify in all her teachings? Yeah. Death and what? Transgression of the law. Mm -hmm. Those two things. What did paganism highlight? That you will never die. Mm -hmm. right. And that man, don't, man is his own law. Man is a law to himself. That's the teachings of paganism. So he just transferred that, that strong teaching. That's what he told Eve. You're your own God. You're not going to die. You're God. How can you die? You're God. Eve believed it. Eve believed that she was a god and she can't die. Adam, it, it's not that Adam believed it. He just didn't want to lose his wife. Go ahead. God is merciful. God is merciful. They can't, they can't destroy what God has put in place until they have a head. <laughs> Amen. Paganism, um, the Jews, they put pagan Rome in charge. We have no king but Caesar. What did Rome do? Destroy the natural temple. Amen. When they made the papacy the head in the 1260, what did he do? Destroy the spiritual temple. Yeah, he did. But at the end of the world, uh, they all, America is only, that's the, 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 man, 
They, America's going to be destroyed. They, 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 they see the head again, America's done. That's the last time Satan's going to have opportunity to destroy anything. But this time, he's going to destroy people. Yep. Literally, he's going to destroy those who have the word of God in them. Amen. And now Christ is going to say, no. I, at each time, Christ came and said he was the head. He came in the, in the time of Rome. He came after the 1260 to the Millerite. And he's going to come again, Revelation 18, to say, no, I am the head. It's really, Amen. it's a battle for who's the head. Amen. That's what it's about. Amen. Who has the power? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. I'm going to close here. I just want us to see this great controversy. There's a reason why we're going through this. Because when we come down to our time with Ellen White, what did Satan use to war against Ellen White then? What did he use? Huh? Not, no, no, no. Not Ellen White personally. Her writings. What did, what did he use to war against? Because he has to continue the warfare. He has to continue it. How does he make people believe that she's not inspired? How did he make them believe the Bible wasn't inspired? How did he make them believe nature wasn't inspired? Hmm. The same way. He didn't change. He just used different instruments or different ways of bringing about the same ends. But that's why we need spiritual eyesight to recognize the character of his method in what he's chosen to use. Is everyone following? That's why we need to be baptized. If we're not baptized, we're not going to be able to discern what, how Satan works. That's the importance of baptism. Another one. Amen. Yes, amen. It's spiritual now. So we need eye salve. We need our eyes anointed so that we can see what method is he using and what method is he trying to use in living waters because he's still here. Is everyone following? And God expects us to discern him when we see him in any of us. He rose up in Peter. Peter lost it for a little while. He said, Lord, this be far from thee. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. Right there. Peter lost it for a little while. He tried to rival Christ. Peter, in that instant, became antichrist. Mm -hmm. In that instant, he was in opposition to going to the cross. He was in opposition to it. This is all paganism does. Makes you oppose the cross. Papacy, oppose the cross. Passe pro, oppose the cross. So wait a minute. So what is Adventist going to make people do? Oppose the cross. Mm -hmm. So the writings of Ellen White teaches people to go to the cross. So it's Adventism is going to set up a system that teaches against going to the cross. Yeah, they challenge inspiration. What are they going to do? And how do they do it? How do they do it? If we recognize it, mm -hmm. we won't participate in that garbage. Mm -hmm. We just won't. We'll keep ourselves spotless, unspotted from the world. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. That's why it's important. To understand this so that we know in whom we're serving and why we're not participating in certain things that we see our Adventist brethren participate in it. Why we can have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but separate from it. The nominal Adventist church is, is, is working darkness. They're leading minds. Even though they, they quote Ellen White, they're leading minds to reject Ellen White. Yeah. How do I know? The Jews quoted Moses. Yeah. But was it to lead people to do what Moses said? Yeah. No, it was to reject Moses. To reject Christ. The Catholic, Church quoted the, the Catholic Church, what they do? They quoted the Bible. But it was to use people to reject the Bible. The Protestant churches, no man knows the day or the hour. Mm -hmm. To reject the going to the cross. So Advent is, Ellen White says that we should do this. No, no, no. You, you're only saying that because it, you, you know you can't deny it. Mm -hmm. You know to come out and openly deny it will make people turn away from you. That's why you're quoting her. The Catholic Church is doing the same thing. They have to quote the Bible to some degree. Yeah, the Protestants had to do it. And the Jews in the time of nature, they had to use nature. Because if they didn't, then they would show themselves not to be connected with those who believe in this system of worship. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that today? Mm -hmm. Are we saying we believe in the fifth day of the fourth month only because you know that everybody around us believe it? Are you saying that you're a vegetarian because everybody around you eat it? Are you keeping the Sabbath because every, you know it's popular, you know you can't come out and say, I don't like the Sabbath? Are you quoting Ellen White because you know everybody in the Adventist church kind of favors Ellen White, so you're quoting it too, so make them seem like you favor it when you really don't in your heart? Is that us? If that's us, by the grace of God, may we repent and serve the true and living God and accept his right way of worship. Amen? Amen? And if that's not us, praise God. Continue walking in that light until God gives you more light so that you can take the next step clearly. Amen? Amen. So praise God for these revelations. We, this is how we know the Lord 
is amongst us, when he makes these things plain to our understanding. And if you don't understand everything I just said, if you understand only one thing, remember the rule. Just walk in that little that you have. Just walk in that. And then when the Lord is ready, he'll add to your understanding so you can take the next step. It's just one step at a time in being a Christian. Amen? Amen. So let's close out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And Lord, I know that what you're teaching us is not the work of man, but it's the work of God. For no man can rightly understand the scriptures except the Holy Spirit helps him and explains it to him. And heavenly angels will come down to explain it as well. And Lord, I just pray, O oh Lord, that the truth would be received and that we would make every effort to reform our lives according to the truth. Please help us to be sincere, faithful, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, O oh Lord. You're looking for sincere people that loves the truth and, and hates every evil way and, and doesn't like wrongs when it's done, O oh Lord. But they will not oppose, they will not, they will not oppress, they will not fight, they will not force people. But what they will do is make the truth forceful and try to help those around them to see the light in what you're teaching and to walk in that light. Please forgive us of our sins. Please create in us a clean heart. Please renew a right spirit within us. And I pray, O oh Lord, that what wasn't clear, that you please lead them to, to, to what will help them to understand that which you're revealing. And a little light in which anyone has received, please, Father, help them to, to improve it, to develop it, polish it for them, O oh Lord. Do that for us, which we cannot do for ourselves. And wherever we have erred today, Lord, please forgive us. And we just ask that you will create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Continue to help us have a blessed Sabbath day today, we pray in Jesus' name.